Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I want to talk about how God's people grow. This is for none but the hungry heart. If you're just uh, interested in, you know, sort of scooting by or just waiting on the Lord to return, and you don't much care about that, this video is not for you. That word grow in the Greek is a word that means to, just what it means, to make to grow, uh, to cause to increase, uh, to become greater. Uh, pretty simple word. Uh, not real complicated. It's it's more like you know it's the process is 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 something that just needs to be discussed. Second Peter three eighteen. Go in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And now we don't have to wade through all of the muck of millions of opinions uh, the, that there are about how that we grow as Christians. Now imagine the simplicity of the Holy Spirit's words, if you can. You know, Lord, how do I grow? in grace and knowledge of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not complicated. Uh, if it sounds simple, well, it's because it was meant to. Meant to. It's human philosophy and uh, wrongly held presuppositions that kind of mucks, mucks it all up so that you can't even see where your feet are, much less where you're going. As we await the Lord, uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to, to be concerned about growing. We're still here. We don't want to just brush it aside. And in the view that, that uh, you know, as far as the process goes, I think that's, it's important that we talk about that. We're going to see him very soon. And uh, it does make a difference as to how we lived our life here when we get caught up together in the clouds to meet him. You know, in view of the fact that the process of maturing in, in Christian life has been the subject of endless discussion with opinions that are often contradictory to one another, I mean, you know, ask 100 people, you'll get 100 answers. It really does kind of, I guess, seem rather presumptuous on my part for me to present, you know, some idea of my own, but, but I'm going to do that. I'm going to begin on the fact, though, that it, it is God who causes the growth, not us, so my opinion is no doubt biased. Let me ask you this. Have you ever in your life seen anything that grew itself? And, and that includes you. If we don't begin on that basis, folks, we're wasting our time here trying to discern anything regarding this matter, in my opinion. I think most believe that the process has to do with simple cause and effect. Just do the right thing and you'll grow. Don't do the right thing and you won't. Therefore, well, now, now it's us that causes the growth, not God. And, or, you, you know, some say, well, we reap what we sow. Okay, I, well, I have no problem with that one. But he that soweth to his flesh, that's law, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, that is grace, shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. Now, while it is true, it does demand some effort on our part, real effort. I mean, the end result is still entirely a work of God, a work of grace. Grace. And folks, you can't wiggle your way off of that hook just because you've been brainwashed to believe that you gain fair uh, favor uh, with God by what you do. Some philosophy based on human merit. The picture in the Bible is we were caught with a net, not a hook, you know, where we could just kind of wiggle our way off, off the hook. You are secure in Christ and you could never, you can never undo the work of God in your life. And you could never, you can never undo the work of God in your life. Undo what Christ did. He either died in your place or he didn't. And he's either working in your life or he's not. 
Spiritual growth is not the result of some process of complete self-surrender of the will, you know, which some holiness movements have insisted is, well, that's all there is to it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul speaks of weakness, does he really mean weakness of will? You know, we, we might well ask the question, well, would a man who could claim to have fought a good fight suggest that no struggle is necessary? Of course, there's a struggle. There's a struggle, but it, it is not against the flesh. It is to walk by faith, not by sight, not by feelings, not by what you think or feel, not by feelings, not by ever-changing emotions, but by faith. Secondly, man cannot in any way, uh, any direct way, assist God in the creation of anything that is perfect. I think this rule applies even for the child of God. I'm going to say that a man who is quite confident that by a constant exercise of willpower he can contribute to his own holiness in God's sight is deceiving himself. You know, while he may be dealing successful, uh, successfully, and I put that in quotes, with one or two consciously recognized areas of failure, and I put that in quotes, in his own life, he can only deal with the things that he recognizes, and, and he's likely to then think that having dealt with those, that he's achieved some measure of maturity, but what he tends to do is merely concentrate on one or two symptoms while ignoring the root cause, the basic disease. Dearly beloved, the Word of God never promises a consciousness of sinlessness. Yet this is what most of us have found victory to mean. The human heart is so desperately wicked that it's like it's like playing whack-a-mole. You know, you know, as soon as you, you whack one mole up pops another. You know, you subdue one bad habit or you get rid of one bad character trait. It, it, it will erupt in a subtle way someplace else. I guarantee it. it. Just doesn't work. And it certainly doesn't gain merit or favor with God. Understanding our position in Christ is vital. I suggest that man's part is not to plant more flowers. You're already made the righteousness of God in Christ. But to keep the weeds down in the, in the garden keep the weeds down in the area in order that the seed of God's planting may grow. The new man is entirely a creation of God in Christ, yet we do play a vital part in its growth. And that part has to do with walking in the light as he is in the light, the truth of God's word. That's the, the real important thing. The real crux of the matter is this. Does man have within himself the power to produce anything that is perfect enough to please God? Well, many Christians would say, well, yeah, Steve, you know, the unbeliever doesn't have this power, but we sure do. You know, the believer does. And I don't think, folks, I don't think Scripture supports that. If by the exercise of a redeemed will, a man could deny every evil desire of a sinful nature, would that make him a righteous man in God's sight? No. No. He'd be like the, the gardener who pulled up every weed just to find out that he couldn't grow anything because he didn't have any seeds. You know, the cleaning up process was excellent, but like the man who swept and put his house in order, Matthew chapter 12, you know, his position wound up being more dangerous than ever. This is the limit of his capacity to institute a cleanup. He doesn't have the capacity to create a new thing. You know, that's, that's something that many artists, by the way, you know, many artists know that. So most don't, but some do. They, they most know that they can only, or some know that they can only arrange what's already created into a, some different form, but they can't create anything new to replace the old. This is the work of God. This is all, only God can do. The most that he can do is to restrain the evil so that God may introduce the good. And this, I think, is the meaning of such uh, passages as, uh, uh, as the following, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
uh, purge himself, uh, Colossians 3, 5, mortify therefore your members, uh, Romans uh, chapter 13, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof, uh, Romans chapter 6, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, uh, Matthew chapter 16, let him deny himself and take up his cross and, and, and so on and so forth. The mortification of the natural uh, inclinations of, of propensities for evil which exist in every one of us is not something which we can undertake without help. It's obvious that a will that is sinful cannot will itself out of existence. The, the help that we need in this process of restraint is promised in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The following verses, I think, uh, shed light on that. They seem to indicate this principle. Uh, Romans chapter 8, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. Hebrews chapter 4, in, we find grace to help in time of need. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there, there is a way of, to escape. And, and in these passages and in many others, the part which we, we, we play is carefully laid out. It is always the restraint of evil, never the creation of righteousness. There is none righteous, no, not one. Not one. All righteousness is of the Lord and that righteousness was imputed to you, okay, credited to you. It wasn't earned. The new man is completely righteous. That's why we don't set about trying to produce our own. There's no need to because we stand before God, holy, blame, holy unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. It is humbling to discover that God has no confidence God has no confidence in our capacity to be good. And it is important to realize that when one man by nature seems to be a better man than another, as, as though relative goodness had some real meaning, the actual truth is that some men are just less evil than others, which is fundamentally a, a, an entirely different thing. And because this is true, I think that we can say with absolute certainty that despite the immature condition of the church in this final age, you know, that it can produce no righteousness in and of itself, it does restrain evil. The Holy Spirit in us is that restraint, and, it, and it's to the extent that without the church, it, this world would be in a mess, a real mess. It, the world wants us gone, but it's unaware for the most part that our absence kind of puts them in a bad place. I think all of this can be summed up in the words of John the Baptist, who said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John chapter 3. The one is neither possible nor safe without the other. Moreover, Paul made it very clear that the new man himself was the sole source of any good thing that he did this new man being the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Galatians 2.20, not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. So it's more appropriate to rejoice not in our victory, so-called, but in the Lord's victory in us. And dearly beloved, the more flowers, the more distasteful the weeds. And the purer the heart, the greater the hatred of the sin which remains. And as sin occupies less space, it becomes more and more distasteful. You know, the, the gardener longing more and more for all flowers, no weeds. And the nearer a man comes to true holiness to himself, the greater will seem that the, it, it'll seem like, well, the more the weeds remain. The following passages beautifully symbolize the process of the building up of the body of Christ, which is his new temple. First, the stones have been prepared and day by day are being brought to the site. First Kings chapter five. We are these stones, living people 
indwelt by his presence, 1 Peter chapter 2. The prophets and the, the apostles form the foundation. That's Ephesians chapter 2. And we are built into the growing structure one by one. As the stones of the first temple were worked up in secret, 1 Kings chapter 6, so the Lord works in us secretly. So it's a hidden work. His, his work, His working being even concealed from ourselves much of the time. And when he's finished, we will with truth be called his workmanship, Ephesians chapter 2. And not our own. He that hath wrought us for this very purpose is God himself, 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. We grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Both. I've been a, a, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the fact that God, well, uh, I don't know, it's, he, he reserves his best for those who mean business. Uh, we need to be reminded of these things. Uh, we live in a dangerous world. I'm talking about not just physically, but spiritually. We're to beware of, of evil workers, beware of the concision. We are the, the circumcision. We worship him in spirit. And in truth, and we rejoice in him, we have no confidence in the flesh. Paul threw away all that confidence that he had in the flesh. You know, if anyone had any, should have had any confidence in the flesh, it was the Apostle Paul. Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the the, the church, as far as touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But he said, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Are we willing to do the same, to think that way? To count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord, for whom we as well we've suffered the loss of all things we just count them but but dumb that we may win christ and be found in him not having our own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of christ I'm, this is philippians chapter 3 the righteousness which is of god which is by faith which we saw in romans that we may know him there's there's your growth an experiential knowledge of him the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Death. If by any means we might attain unto the out-resurrection of the dead in this life, where we walk on resurrection ground, not as though we've already attained it, or we're already perfect, but we follow after if, if that which... So to apprehend that for which also that we are apprehended of Christ Jesus. We forget those things which are behind. It's, hard, it's very difficult for some of us. Reaching forth unto those things which are before. And we press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of, of God in Christ Jesus. We are to walk by that same rule minding the same thing, being, you know, in unity with one another of the same mind. We are of the same body, same spirit. We're to mark them which walk. Uh, many, many, many walk. Uh, Paul warned them, said many walk. I've told you often, now I'll tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Why did he say, why did he say cross of Christ? Because of what Christ accomplished on that cross. Their, their mind is on earthly things, not on spiritual things. Our conversation is in heaven from, from where we also look for the, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our 
body that it may be fashioned like unto his own glorious body, according to the working whereby he's able even to subdue all things unto himself. This is our blessed hope. This is what we do every day of our lives. No vacation. Our focus is on things above, not on things below. We rest in him to accomplish in us what we cannot, could not possibly accomplish ourselves. And we give him all the glory and all the honor, all the credit. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Please keep continue to keep uh, us in prayer, Sue and I. Uh, Sue's really doing better, but she's just got a ways to go. Uh, please continue to pray for the direction of this ministry. Uh, join us on Sunday as we continue our study in the book of Galatians. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.